Great, thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone to this evening's event. Um, it's always sort of disconcerting and sort of beguiling, charming, dizzying at some level to think of where everyone's beaming in from. These, uh, these Zoom events are not new, of course, we've been experiencing them now for many years, but it is quite extraordinary, uh, something that didn't really happen until a few years ago that we now take for granted. So it's a great pleasure to have you all beaming in from wherever you're from. Um, this is the series called Attention is a Moral Act. Um, and we have one particular event tonight. And I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker, first of all. And then I'm going to say a little bit about the series and contextualize tonight's event. Um, so just give me a second to say that tonight's um, co-discussant with Ian is Philip Goyle, who is a theoretical physicist and associate professor at the University of Albany where he studies open foundational questions in physics and related fields. His work has led to the proposal that the identical quantum particles manifest a new kind of complementarity, a complementarity of persistence and non-persistence. You can already feel the paradoxical allusions to Ian's work. More broadly, he sees our physical theories as providing a window into the relationship between thought and reality. In this respect, he's interested in how and why we reflect physical reality in thought though in the ways that we do, as well as investigating the limitation of thought and capturing the richness of physical reality. So it's very intense, very first principles. And Philip and Ian will be considering why the mechanistic conception of reality continues to hold such sway over so many. Um, and also look at some metaphysical reflections, looking for deeper understandings of the, the human mind and also the biases of the human mind and considering the role of meditative and contemplative practices. At least that's what they're meant to be talking about. Of course, they may have their own ideas and the conversation always goes where it goes. So as you can see with, with that description, it's, it's, um, it's possible to engage in Ian's work at a very deep scientific and philosophical level. And indeed, many do and many have. And it's really important periodically to come back to those absolute fundamental touchstones of the intellect to understand what are we really talking about here. Ian's most recent work, especially The Matter with Things, really is a, a deep encounter with reality. First of all, how, how, how can we know it? How do we know it? And then on the basis of that, what is it likely to be like? Um, and I know that Philip's given that a great deal of reflection and they've spoken together. Let me just back up slightly from tonight's event to put it in a larger context. This series is called Attention as a Moral Act. And people might wonder, you know, in what way is it a moral act? Um, and how does that link to questions of physics? Um, how can it possibly be one conversation? It can often seem like it's too many things at once. Is this about the brain? Is it about attention? Is it about morality? Is it about physics? Is it about how we know? Is it about the truth? Is it in some way about civil society and democracy and climate change? The answer is sort of yes to all of the above. Um, but how we go about that conversation is quite challenging. It requires a great deal of care and discernment. Um, and we've had a series now speaking with a range of different kinds of speakers, philosophers, imagination activists, metaphysicians of various kinds. Um, and it's really great to finally have a physicist to speak to um, because Ian himself is not a physicist, as I'm sure he'll be quick to admit. Absolutely. But, but I, what I love about his, his engagement with physics is that it, he followed where the inquiry led. He, he bumped into reality and said, I know others who may have bumped into reality before. I wonder how they see it. And that's how why we were so keen to bring Philip uh, Goyle to speak tonight and why it's necessary to return to first principles even when you want to speak about other matters. And in future events, we will be quite soon speaking um, about, well, we're speaking in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks' time with Rupert Reed about the, the notion of progress in philosophy and how that connects to the climate challenge. We'll be speaking to Anthea Lawson about the relationship between Ian's work and activism. And just next week, hot off the press, let me quickly tell you that we're also speaking to um, Amir uh, Shahid. Yeah, Amir, that's right, Ian. One more time, Amir Shahid. Shahid, yeah. Amir Shahid, who I believe has a fascinating connection vis a vis his practical work, but again, very grounded in philosophical understanding of your work. 
So this whole series is both first principles, philosophy and science and application into the public realm, um, which is why it's several events and uh, why we're delighted tonight to focus on one deep vein. We're keen for the audience when you come to your questions, really pay attention to the talk. Listen carefully to Philip and Ian, even if you're not a physicist or a philosopher of physics, think about what it means to you. What do you hear? What are you looking out for? And do what you can to engage with this conversation because Ian's work is already taking on great international importance. People are talking about it a lot, but we're very keen to get beyond the basic description of the hypothesis, very keen to move the conversation into new frontiers. And with that, I'm very happy to leave you uh, to Philip and Ian. Um, I may see you later on, but if not, I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Okay. Well, Philip, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, I know from a conversation particularly that we had some years ago in a tea house in London, which lasted for several hours, that we have amazing numbers of uh, perceptions that I think coincide, though there are differences between us from your perspective in physics and mine in neuroscience and philosophy. I'm no physicist, but I have spent some time reading what I can of uh, and what I can understand of physics. And what I think I've perceived there is something that's very broadly consonant with the thesis I'm putting forward based on neuroscience and philosophy. Right, right. Um... Well, and let me just say that, first of all, it's, you know, it's a great pleasure to talk with you. We, we talked many years ago in person, um, and mm. um, your book is, is really full of delight. At that point, it was still in process. Um, so it's, it's yeah. fantastic to have a chance to talk with you about, about the book, particularly part three, which is more about the metaphysics uh, side of things. So a little bit of context as to where I'm coming from that I can I think will help maybe contextualize the discussion. Um, that I, as a as a young person, really fell in love with the mechanistic conception of physics. I thought it was very majestic and very powerful, um, and promised to reveal a great deal of the hidden structure of reality. Um, and I followed that track for a number of years. And then at some point I went through an interesting transformation where I started where, where from, from a left, from a hemispheric point of view, I started to perceive reality from the right hemispheric point of view. Um, and it was at that point that I realized the sort of the dark side of the mechanistic conception. I realized that it, and that it had been taken too far. It had been extrapolated too far into our culture and it actually squeezed out other ways of, of conceiving of reality. It had deprived them of a sense of importance. Um, and I was then faced with the challenge of bringing together these two different views of reality. Uh, there was a part of me that would still, from you could say, that was still enamored by the classical conception of reality, and I could see the power and the beauty of it. But then there was another part of me that felt that, well, no, there's, there's so much about reality that's left out. And for example, how does one account for the, the nature of living things and the, the sanctity of a living thing, of an organism? Um, and so that was the, the challenge that I face as, an, as, a, as, a, as a young person. And I, I realized that a natural entry point was quantum mechanics because through its natural organic development, the physics community, by going from the macro all the way down to the macro and pushing this mechanical conception to the limit, discovered that at some point it breaks. At some point it, has, it gives way to something else. But what is that something else? Um, and it just so happens that the best expression we have of, well, what happens, what, what's, what, we, what are we left with, is a mathematical formalism, the, the quantum formalism, the mathematics of quantum theory that was created in the form that we know today in 1926. And almost immediately, the, the great figures of the time in physics, people like Bohr and Schrodinger, Heisenberg and so on, realized that this 
posed an enormous challenge to the mechanistic conception and that we need to really rethink this conception and the, we have to unearth the assumptions that we've taken as granted for so long and, and re-examine them and try to understand what is, it, what is the message of this mathematics that works so well. Uh, unfortunately, as, as far as I can see, that process, although it got started in the late 1920s and early 1930s, it then r really kind of ground to a halt, as far as I can see, largely for external reasons, the, the uh, Great Depression, the Second World War. And after mm. that, there was a great shift of the center of gravity of scientific research, as far as I can see, to the Anglo-Saxon world. Everything became much more ut utilitarian in nature and the philosophical mm. reflections that people like Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger did were suddenly really not that welcome in physics anymore. And so this job of, of reflecting deeply at a philosophical and metaphysical level on the products of physics and, and revising this mechanical conception in light of the products of physics, that process was, was really interrupted very severely. And um, when I started my research career, it was still very much um, very quiet. And I had to look very hard to find any way, any hope of, of tackling this question. But I managed to find a way. Um, and so for the last 20 years, I've been working on a program which is called the Reconstruction of Quantum Theory, which as the, the name suggests, the idea is to take the mathematics of quantum theory, which is very obscure in its meaning, and to, re, to build it up again on the basis of principles that are much more amenable to philosophical reflection. Um, this was thought to be virtually impossible sort of just even 30 years ago, but now there's a great deal of work that's been done. And what I've been doing recently is, which is when I contacted you in fact, is to philosophically reflect on the reconstructed quantum theory and to try to tease yeah. out the metaphysical implications. And I think this is um, terribly important, not only for the further development of physics, but also culture as a whole, because I think people instinctively look to physics as, as kind of the, the heart of science. And if we can articulate a coherent alternative to the mechanical conception of reality uh, that's based in what is our most powerful physical theory, then, then that automatically gives it a great deal of... Um, how to say, well, it, it, it's now something that's grounded in the mathematics and the physics and the experimental data. So it gets a, a lot more attention. Yes, yes. There are a couple of things you said that if I might, I would reflect on. Um, one is a parallel that I hadn't really thought of um, between what happened in biology and what happened in physics. I, I'm aware that early in the 20th century there were a number of thinkers in biology um, such as um, John Haldane, the father of J.B.S. Haldane, and the two of them, Conrad uh, Hal Waddington um, and the Austrian von Bertalanffy, who were seeing biology in a way which I would consider far more enlightened than what had gone before. It was, a, if you like, they were seeing elements of the differences between organisms and machines and seeing that these were at the core of understanding life. But then something happened in the 40s, which was that there began a great expansion of the sense of being able to control life through reading and manipulating a code, the DNA. And um, uh, of course, that is a marvellous step forward. And one thing I might say just before we go any further is that although I sometimes am engaged in um, saying that a certain point of view is very important, my, my, my philosophy is based on the idea that no one way of looking is enough on its own. And so when I quite rightly, in my view, value one way of looking higher than another, it doesn't mean that the other has nothing to contribute. And quite clearly, this period of scientific research gave a great deal to us. But now, at last, biologists are beginning to see that it's simply not enough. I mean, in a way, when we 
managed finally to decode the human genome, we found that there's simply not by <laughs> by many, many orders of magnitude, nearly enough information there. Um, so uh, nowadays, people are becoming much more open. I'm thinking of um, uh, Michael Levin, with whom I'm having a series of discussions um, on the internet, who is, of course, a, a, a leading developmental biologist at Tufts, and um, other people uh, like um, James Shapiro, uh, who have embraced a quite different view of the organism. And I'm hoping, actually, to be able to talk to um, I've just forgotten her name, um, Kriti Sharma, Kriti Sharma, who wrote a fabulous book called Interdependence about biology. And my reason for mentioning all this is that I had seen that there's, as it were, there was um, a nascent uh, parallel to what was happening in physics early in the 20s. And then it was, if you like, it took a nosedive <laughs> and it's only beginning to catch up again. But what you're describing is almost that something similar has happened in physics, that physics, after this wonderful burgeoning of insight with all these fantastic geniuses, people like Planck and Heisenberg uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and Schrodinger, and, you know, all these great names, um, people like Bohr and, and so forth. It, it, you're, I think, and if I'm getting you right, you're saying that it, it took a more mechanistic turn really again. And this interests me because just the other day I was at CERN and I was talking to John Ellis, who's a, a, a sort of a, a veteran a physicist of both London and CERN. And I think what he was saying is that he wanted to find a way of bridging these two images of the world or ways of seeing the world. And that's, of course, exactly what I want as well. It doesn't mean that they're of symmetrical interest, however. Yes, it's it's wonderful that you that you see that parallel in the biology. Uh, at some point, because um, I, 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 when we talked in London, in fact, I I mentioned the work of Robert Rosen, the mathematical yes. biology. Um, you and, introduced me to that, and it's been enormously influential. Well, that's wonderful. In fact, so when I when I encountered his work, this was in 1998, uh, and it's actually what brought me back to physics and to quantum mechanics, because at that point I turned away from physics. And um, but then I realized that if I'm going to understand what Rosen was saying about living things, that that they embody a form of organization that's beyond the mechanical, right? that exactly. they cannot fundamentally be understood in mechanical terms. I thought that was such a daring idea yeah. that he managed to express some degree in mathematical terms that I thought I have to find a way of making connection between that and physics and and really quantum physics seemed like the closest you know, the best yes. chance we have of making yes. that connection yes um, another thing that, that point, I point no go on you please, go ahead sorry, sorry. no go ahead um yeah, so I, after that, at some point, I actually did a timeline mm -hmm. uh, of biology, the <laughs> thinking in biology. And indeed, uh, things took a nosedive just after the 1930s and into mm. the 40s. Mm. It, it became very mechanistic. Mm. And that's at that, around that time, I realized that this was a common pattern across certainly physics and biology. Yeah. And then I realized it was really because of this huge cultural shift, uh, really this shift of center of gravity. Mm. Um, really of scientific research. Um, so it's really about basically what's the, the a host culture, really. Yes, yes, yes. It's, um, I, I just wanted to thank you for the introduction to Robert Rosen, who's a mathematical biologist, but who saw the philosophical meaning of, of uh, complex systems and their complete difference from complicated and closed systems. And he, um, uh, and you actually uh, fired my excitement to read it. And I read, he wrote, just for those who are listening who don't know Robert Rosen, he wrote a book called, es well, he wrote a book originally called Life Itself and a more approachable book called Essays on Life Itself. And um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned was a complete revelation to me. And I've been thinking about it quite a lot. It sounds on the face of it highly improbable, but what he was saying is that life is not an anomaly in an otherwise inanimate cosmos, but in a sense, animacy is the norm. And that inanimacy is a kind of um, 
uh, what would one say, a sort of um, uh, a, 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 a final case of of the inanimate when uh, of the animate when it finally loses all its animacy. But of course, one only approaches it asymptotically, and so really, uh, I've done a lot of these sort of what I call limit case reversals in my work. You know that motion was always thought to be the abnormal thing, that you, things are normally static until put in motion, but of course it's the other way around. And there's about a dozen of those that I outlined in the first few pages of the book, that we've got the world upside down, if you like. Fantastic, yes. Yes, so I mean, th that was for me the, the revelatory notion that Rosen was putting out, that, that m what we call mechanical systems, things that we can explain in mechanistic terms, in terms of atoms in motion in the void following yes. the universal that those mechanistic systems are a limiting case or a special case of of of, of the of the organism yes yes the abstract. yes yes indeed and, and so yes um, and the so the connection now to to quantum physics if i may is that, yes um, yes that, that there is this extraordinary connection and it's it's something that's really only become really clear to me in my work the last few years so and i've already discussed it with you but let me briefly describe this that yes um, so let me just go back to the atomistic conception democritus right atoms yes. are in motion in space and um, supposed to account for everything um, and so from a metaphysical point of view atoms are what would be would be we would say are individuals they have independent existence and they have formal unity. So they have these two characteristics. And the independent existence means that each atom, as it were, is, is, a, is a world in itself. It's a thing in itself. And its existence doesn't depend on any other atoms or anything else. So it has some intrinsic nature, which is fixed for all time. And then in the, in the Newtonian picture, we would say that these atoms can interact with one another. But those interactions are strictly external, so to speak. They never touch the innermost essence of the, the thing itself. So you can form holes in, in a sense, in a, in a left hemispheric sense. You can form holes um, of these atoms in motion, and they can exhibit complex behavior, which is very difficult to predict. But that's as far as you can express the concept of wholeness. The, so in other words, the right hemisphere's notion of wholeness goes much deeper than that, and you can't express that within the mechanistic conception. So just parenthetically, uh, a lot of work in so-called complex systems, um, including in biology, is still has a mechanistic underpinning. And so what they're really talking about is really complicated systems uh, yes. in some sense, right? So it's still mechanical but they exhibit complex behavior. For example, gene networks that Steve Kaufman has worked on, that, that kind, Stuart Kaufman. Mm. So then the question is, if we want to go deeper, we want to express the notion of organism at a deeper level, how do we do it? And so briefly, what, what I've come to is this following idea that when you have, say, two electrons in a helium atom, so you have two electrons there, that those electrons no longer can unconditionally be regarded as independently existing. Um, so we, 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 we normally still use the language. Physicists typically will still say there are two electrons in the helium atom, but um, strictly that's only partial, that's only a partial truth that it, so the partial truth, I, I, I have a name for it, I call it the persistence model, and that is still, we're still thinking about these electrons as individually persistent things. But then there's another perspective which says that what there is in the atom are, is a single persistent object, and it manifests as these two flashes, or the, in other words, whenever we, when we do a measurement, it, we will see what look like two electrons, but yeah. those two electrons are simply a temporary manifestation that's provoked, as it were, by a measurement process, yeah. but they're not intrinsic. And so I find this rather intriguing because it's a way of, of seeing in quantum theory 
a, a deeper kind of wholeness which penetrates all the way down to existence itself right the very what, what we actually say exists so uh, i would be rather intrigued to hear what i mean whether you, how to say whether you find that a sort of in some sense uplifting or hopeful in a sense like bringing these perspectives closer together well, not only do I find that hopeful, but I believe it's true, which is a more important point, in the sense that um, there are different levels of truth. And I think one will never understand every, anything if one thinks there is a single thing called truth and something has it or it doesn't. Um, and there are a lot of things in what you said that um, resonated with, with things that I um, would believe philosophically speaking, I mean, one is that one is about um, the fact that wholes and parts are, uh, are to some extent an artifice, they're, they're an artifact of the way in which we look at the world. And what we see as a part at one level, as a whole, as another level. And that ultimately, um, everything is interconnected ultimately, but that it's very important to be able to differentiate within that oneness, otherwise we have no, nothing there. We need both, as I'm always saying, uh, and it was best expressed by, by Goethe, who said that division and union, this process of, as he called it, the systole and diastole, taking a matter from the beating of the heart, the breathing and out-breathing is the whole business of nature, dividing what is united and uniting what is divided. So um, in a spirit I think we both share, um, it's not that one of these ways of thinking alone is valuable. Both of these elements are there in the universe, a unifying force and a... a, a, a a varying or, 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 or I don't want to say dividing because in fact dividing suggests complete division and what I'm suggesting is distinguishing, a distinguishing force which is what makes the whole um, expand into what is implicit in it. So that I think the business of the cosmos is a constant unfolding explication of something that never loses its wholeness by this process of explication. It remains one as a flower that unfolds is no less a flower than it was when it was a tight bud. So I see that as an important element. I think there are two other so things that I'd just like to say before handing back to you. One is that we think that or, or, when I say we, I think a lot of people who um, don't perhaps have the, the physical background, physicist background that you have, might think that when one gets down to the sort of level of an atom, first of all, that there is a thing there, which there isn't, there's a process or a field, and at times it, it can coalesce in certain ways or be perceived as, as, as a punctate, whereas it, it, it normally one might say it is more extended. So it's a matter of degree and, and a force field rather than a, a thing as we now think of it. But there are also those atom atomic particles are not in fact identical. And um, the physicist Richard Muller said something so good, I thought it might um, be worth uh, repeating. We now know that two objects, objects that are completely identical, identical in every way, can behave differently. Two identical radioactive atoms decay at different times. Their future is not determined by their past or by their condition. Their quantum mechanics wave function. Identical conditions do not lead to identical futures. Now, since I know we want to talk about time and its role in all these things, I thought that was very interesting. Because apart from anything else, um, if it's true that something is what it is in context, and this is another hugely important theme, both in my philosophy, in biology, and I believe for you in physics, because you've raised this question, um, if context is why we, the neglect of context is why we misunderstand things that appear to be contrary, because we, we don't know that one is in a quite different context than the other. If that's the case, that object, that atom, that, that atomic particle, whatever it is we're looking at, can never be the same as another one because it's now in a different time. And everything that has happened between has now modified the context in which it exists. And so that context of time is very liberating, actually. I mean, we think of time as this 
um, thing that limits life and is somehow an adversary, but I have tried to write that time is something that actually allows everything to be what it is to unfold the process of creativity is impossible without it and so on. Because I believe that it's not just an unfolding of what is predetermined. Physics used to think that, you know, in the Laplacian way, that if you could specify the position and momentum of every particle in the new universe, you could predict every single thing that happens afterwards. We now know that that's not the case, not because of some very rarefied kind of quantum physics that only applies at the microscopic level, but at the macro level, that you cannot predict the movements of even macroscopic life-size objects after a very small number of interactions. So I want to say that in this, there is a freedom from predeterminism, a freedom from specificity and certainty, a sort of sense of the importance of con context, a having to accept that we can never finally know or specify anything, but that doesn't mean we can't know more and more about it and can't say truthful or non-truthful things about it. And that all this way of thinking is so typical of the right hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere is working in the opposite direction, but it needs that contrary motion. It needs that um, opposition. I often say that nothing comes into being without resistance. So one needs these two forces, if you like, although one is greater than the other. And I would hold, you might not, that one is actually truer in some sense to the big picture than the other. That the other still gives us information at a more local level that is usable and important. Wow, yes. <laughs> so many things to say there. If I may, I mean, I'd like to back off slightly uh, and actually just ask you about essentially the something that's been on my mind recently, which is how to, in some sense, trace the evolution of human thought. I mean, that's obviously a very huge, big topic, but in a more focused way, that is, in going from the nomadic to agriculture mode of, of living, that language, this is a, you know, an idea that's out there already, that language, a great deal of pressure was put on human thought to become more abstract and more precise. This was in part needed because we're dealing with a very large number of people who don't necessarily know each other. And the time horizons of an agricultural community are so large compared with a nomadic group because they have to plan and act over, over months, years in order to achieve the goal that they have. So it seems that this process of making thought more abstract and more precise, and then obviously reflecting that in language, then brought about the possibility of taking ordinary utterances of everyday life, and then taking them very, very seriously, construing them in a way that was never intended, would have never been conceivable for a nomadic individual. So for example, if I say, I see a pack of wolves over the hill, um, that would be just a simple informational statement at one level. But if I take it literally, and I say that there's a, there's a geometrical place at this moment in time, at this instant in time, where that group is located, then if I take the language to be that precise, if I take it to mean something that precise, then you end up with a potential paradoxical situation, which is like really the Zeno arrow paradox. Yeah. yeah I'm talking about chapter 16 now of your book, of which I, I loved, by the way. Um, that, and so there, the, yes. if you like, the left hemispheric tendency to want to decontextualize and make things extremely precise comes head to head with the right hemispheric perception of reality, right? So from the left hemispheric point of view, it looks like there's no flow, there's no motion in an instant. Yes, exactly. Time is made up of instants and therefore that over an interval of time, there's no motion. Yep. The right hemisphere says that's bonkers. Now clearly there's motion. So you have the first awakening of this, this creation of this tremendous tension between hemispheres. And then it, it's extraordinary for me that then when science, as we know it, modern science got going in the 1650s or 1600s, 1700s, that it, it kind of uh, ignored those paradoxes. It says, look, <laughs> particle is at a point, mm -hmm. at an instant of time, but it also has a velocity. And, and don't ask me don't ask me why, but it does, right? So the motion is brought in, as it were, 
by the back through door. The back. <laughs> yeah, through the back door. <laughs> <laughs> then fast forward to quantum mechanics, uh, something like 300 years later, we're faced with this problem again. And, and so quantum mechanics indeed says that if you take an electron and you precisely localize it, um, one way of reading the formalism is that it, it's saying that the electron now, from that point onwards, has no memory of its past. It's forgotten everything because you, you've specified its location exactly to a point. Mm. And so the concept of motion now is not possible. Like it's, it's completely frustrated because if you say, well, why is an electron where it is later on? You can't explain that by saying, well, it it's because it had a certain velocity at the initial time. So this, so in other words, we, we, we re-encounter Zeno's paradox of motion effectively now in, a, in, in our fundamental physical theory of the subatomic, the atomic world. And then co complementarity, Bohr's complementarity essentially is, is a response to that. You can think of it as a response to that. I won't get into the technical details of that. That would really be too much here. But you know, the wave particle idea, which you mentioned, of course, in yeah. the book, so I, I suppose just reflecting on mm. where we stand now in this larger context of the development of human language and human thought, mm. I'm kind of curious to see, well, you know, where, from your perspective, do you see it progressing forward? I, as I said, I see mm. quantum mechanics and deciphering it to be of critical importance yes. for, the, for the development of thought yes. and language. I yes. think we have to refine our language to make it more context rich, as you're saying. Yes, well, I mean, uh, sorry, go on. No, no, please, I'm done, yes. Okay, no, well, as you know, Niels Bohr said, um, there's no use in trying to talk about what we're describing in physics unless we use the language of poetry. We need to use metaphors. Well, this is not so crazy because in fact, all language is metaphorical and all the language of science is already metaphorical. When you think about it, all these technical terms are derived from everyday physical experiences, if you look at them etymologically. So everything is a metaphor. And if we lose sight of the fact that everything is a metaphor, you see, I say that the metaphor is not a strange case of the literal, but the literal is a limit case of the metaphor. And, and really what, one, what is important to realize is that this instant simply does not exist. It's a fiction that we use for certain calculative purposes. But to think that actually the world is made up of instants is, is a huge error. It's made up of what flows, as was perceived thousands of years ago in both East and West. And if I were to say, and I like the thing about memory, so let's come to that. So the, does the particle the, the, at this instant, well, it never is at that instant. You can get closer and closer and closer and you make the time limit smaller and smaller. You will never in infinity achieve that instant. It doesn't exist. And so it is never actually at rest. And what, what, what is important about it is its history and its future, as you say, because it is not this isolated particle that the, I would say the left hemisphere is able to focus on because that is useful to it, but there is no reality to it. If there is a stream, and I want to examine the flow, it's no good my saying I'm going to sort of go into this stream and take a slice of it, and maybe I can capture the flow finally, because of course, the flow is going through it before and after. And what comes before any moment that you can, as it were, take a photograph of, and what comes after makes sense in terms of a flow that is behind that event that you're looking at. So what the problem has been decontextualizing, which you do by slicing. And this problem of decontextualizing is so fundamental, it lies behind so many problems. And indeed, as you have commented, um, and William James himself said that, that, that half the trouble that scientists and philosophers have with paradoxes is because they don't understand that context is all important. They decontextualize and then they find they've got a problem. Now, I'm not saying that there's no, no value to the knowledge that one gets from this um, deceiving um, uh, experience. Did I lose connection there or are we still connected? No, no, okay, good. Um, 
there's, it's not that it has no value, but it has a technical kind of use for a while. But it's a mistake if we found our philosophy on it. And coming to your question about where do I see us now, what I would like to think is that there is there are corrections. I mean, in fact, the second part of my, my older book, The Master and His Embassy, was an attempt to show that during the course of a declining civilization, there are movements both ways where we see the inadequacy of one way of looking and embrace the other more. Um, but I also suggest that sometimes this can turn from a, a case of negative feedback into one of positive feedback in which things simply accelerate towards um, a catastrophe. And I, I have the feeling that that is what we're in, but I, I absolutely don't um, want to predict the future. You know, as Niels Bohr said, prediction is very difficult, particularly when it concerns the future. And I just don't pretend to be able to, but I see signs that people are wholly dissatisfied with the consequences of this uh, reductionist, materialist, mechanistic way of thinking. And w what I've done is to look at the grounds of this in, as I see it, in neurology and philosophy, and hope to find, and I, when I open the physics books that I read, I find so many parallels, so many resonances, and I'm thinking, yes, they are finding this too. And so the idea that there have been corrections, both in biology and physics, in our own time, leads me to think that it may be possible that we can quickly move to, we really need to disattend, not wholly, because it's not wholly unhelpful, to what the left hemisphere shows, but make sure that it's recontextualized within what the right hemisphere knows. Because the, the great beauty of the right hemisphere, left hemisphere relationship is that the right hemisphere can take both. The left hemisphere says that it has to be this or it has to be that. And one of the problems I get into in conversations with people who are so used to thinking it, it has to be this or it has to be that terms is that they think I'm saying it's all this or it's all that, but it's not. It is both even though they're asymmetrical. Yeah. I suppose the, the challenge from a, from, a, from a scientific or let's say the physicist perspective as I see it is that this, this act of decontextualizing, which you could see in, epitomized in Newtonian mechanics where you, you have these atoms that have independent existence, sort of independent of context, you have the laws of nature, which are sort of sitting out there outside the universe. They, they cause things to happen, but they're unchanged. We have space, which is the un, unchanging uh, platform uh, or stage on which everything happens. So everything is, is fixed and decontextualized. Uh, that so much has come from that, on the other hand. You see, it's been so profoundly inspirational. I mean, the... the the idea of atomism in the time of the Greeks was pure metaphysical fancy. And today it's virtually regarded as proven fact. Uh, and we have the germ theory of disease and we have, we have Dalton's theory of chemistry and modern chemistry. And all of that development, which happened over roughly a 300 year period has been profoundly inspired by this idea, you see. So on the one hand, from a scientific perspective, we've gained so much by saying, let's not worry about context, <laughs> right? Let's not worry too much about it right now. Let's just see how far this will take us. And this drive for precision has been extraordinarily important as well, because it's led to quantification of all sorts of qualitative experiences like temperature, color, um, things of that nature. So the I think the the dilemma almost for the, 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 the minds that have seen the power of this decontextualizing way of thinking is how to, how to keep that spirit alive and how to take it forward. And in the face of the demand to take into account context, take into account, for example, the right hemispheres um, sense of wholeness or oneness. And I think that is the, the feeling of you know, loss aversion, right? It, it's a, there's a very sound, strong sense that for the right hemisphere context is the triviality. It's obvious, it's obvious that it's the case. 
from the left hemisphere's point of view, it feels like, well, I'm going to have to give up my, my way of thinking. And, and, and it's not clear how you might do science it, or, or do physics or fundamental physics if you take context into account. So that's why I feel that we're at a stage where human thought at, at kind of at this level needs to evolve to the point where it can see how to take forward the scientific endeavor, particularly exploration of the physical world at the, this extraordinary level of precision to how we can take that forward and, and still incorporate the more of the the insights of reality that come from the right hemisphere. Uh, I mean, for example, yeah. Niels Bohr concept of, of complementarity. I mean, he, he thought that was incredibly important mm. for epistemology, you know, for, yes. for, for humanity, right? He tried to apply it all over the place. So I, I think this is, I think it would really give hope if we could see how to do this. And I think it would prepare I, our thinking so that it would, it would make it easier for us to grasp the living as living. Yes, I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I would embrace almost all of it. Um, it's a useful way to think. For example, I want to build a garage. I find a piece of flat ground, I build a garage. I didn't need to take into account the fact that the earth is actually curved. But if I extrapolate it from my garage that, and everything I see around me that the earth is flat, I would be deeply deluded about the earth. But it would be quite useful to forget it for the purposes of everyday business. So it's not that it, it isn't useful sometimes to sort of forget parts of the context, but when you forget them, they don't become untrue. When you then pan out from the little view, you find the bigger one. And every little view only makes sense in terms of a broader view. You can make it make sense in its own terms. But I'm not interested in that because I was writing a book about, and I believe every philosopher is, and probably every physicist, at least the thinking ones, are keen on knowing what reality is. That's what fires them up. Now, there are many everyday people um, in science who, as it were, go to the lab, nine to five, go home, feed the dog. It's their way of living. They don't want to question things too much because it's been the basis of their career and so on. And I have no objection to that. But if there are other physicists, and they often seem to be, um, well, I don't know, I won't say anything about that, but there, there are some physicists and there are some biologists um, who don't take this kind of a view. And to me, they're the bigger, broader minded people who actually make the changes in the history of science. They're the people who see the big picture. And I'm not interested in science per se, unless it leads to truth. I mean, okay, I am interested in its utility too, but not as a guide to its truth. And to that extent, you know, I need an injection of whatever it is, that's fine. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. But I don't want um, people to imagine that, um, that biology is reducible to simple chain reactions. If you look at a very, very complex picture, you can find, if you zoom in, little areas where there are linear cause, chains of causation. And it's not untrue that there are linear chains of causation. It's just untrue if you extrapolate from that, that the whole thing is made up of linear chains of causation. This is Robert Rosen again. Exactly, exactly. So he, his metaphor, which is, which is very nice and very simple, is that it, it, the mechanism is to a living thing as a tangent plane is to exactly. a curve. Exactly, exactly. And funnily enough, that was an image I used in my very first book in my 20s, um, against criticism, which now nobody can find, I'm afraid, but that's life. Um, well, I, I found it. <laughs> you found it, way! <laughs> but in that, I said, this kind of thinking is like trying to approximate to a curve using as many tangents as you like. And I, I, I quote um, Nicholas of Cusa uh, as making the same point in the 15th century. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it, it's a recurring image, which I think is really important because it's about you know, the fact is that a, a straight line is an unusual thing. It's largely in our minds. And if it is encountered anywhere in the universe, which is a question that can be debated, um, because arguably there are no straight lines in nature, 
Um, it's really just the limit case of a curve. It's just what happens to a curve when it loses all its curviness. Um, so I think that's that, that's important. What I'd like to touch on, though, is this idea of a flow, um, which clearly isn't a straight line, and its relation to past and future. Because one of the things you, you've, you've commented on paradoxes, uh, the paradox chapter and on some of the paradoxes, and I think that we would probably agree that, um, there are, well, this is what I say, you tell me whether you agree, that there are probably three or four important principles that are usually involved in paradox. One is mistaking being able to take something to pieces with whatever it is you get when you simply reconnect those pieces. So a sign of analysis which mistakes the nature of the whole that it's dissecting. And if that whole is time, for example, which it quite often is in paradoxes, it's making mistakes. It also neglects context. We've talked about that. And as soon as you change the context, you see that the paradox may resolve. And uh, I think um, another is that you go to the end of a process and then reflect on it backwards. And this is a point that's made by Bergson, that I can move my arm like this. And yes, afterwards, you can say it went through point A. But there was no point A when the, when the arc was made, as it were, the, the movement was a single thing. And he makes the two, two differences between what he considers the nature of reality and this way of thinking, which is, which leads to so many problems and paradoxes. He says, you know, walking around an old town is not the same as the sum of all the snapshots, however many you take. And the other is to say that reality is not like a lady's fan on which whatever it is, is already painted. And all you do is open up the fan and at a time just opens the fan of what was already there. But it is in fact new and creative all the time, which I really believe. And I think that my understanding of physics is in harmony with that idea. I think that certainly the very notion of instance of time, as I was mentioning with quantum theory, um, if you take this, this idea that time can be, we can think of a moment in time and we can and then we can talk in very precise terms about where something is at that moment in time that that very idea as it were destroys the possibility of motion yes. so in other words it seems essential to re, to kind of have a chance of retaining the notion of flow or motion that we don't have we don't allow ourselves to think about location in this way i mean also it's important to think about again, language here, mm. the notion of point is a limiting process. Exactly. It's meant to be the limit of an infinite process. Yes. And yet we, when we use the word point, it's a noun. And so it's easy to think it's like a cup. It's a noun, yes. you know, yes. a point is a cup, but as if the point exists. Exactly. But the very point, the very point of, a, of the notion of point is that it, it's the limit of an infinite process. So it's not ever actually reached. This is always so a process, a, not a thing. This is what I'm yeah. getting at in most of my philosophy is that we make a mistake when we think in terms of things, if we think of things as either separate or static, because this is always processual. Yes. And, and so I think, so my way of, of coming to terms with, with paradox, the, you know, the paradox of motion, which is really about how do we get flow back into our thinking um, is at least, again, I hear I'm trying to read quantum mechanics most directly. So I would say that we can still talk about moments in time. Let us say we allow ourselves to still talk about moments in time. But what we would do is to say that when we, when we actually perceive any object, and this is including in the laboratory, we never actually ever see it at a point, you know, at a geometrical point. As I said, that's an infinite, that's, that's an infinite process, uh, the, the, the idea of the identification of a point. So what we can instead say is that the object has a is located at a region. So yes. we have to, we have to actually generalize the concept of location to regions. Very much. Which is which is a very strange idea for from from a certain point of view, it's not there in geometry, as the Greeks developed it. Um, points for the primitives, um, 
the points and lines. So the Greeks gave us accept... much, but they, sorry, I was going to say the Greeks gave us so very much, but they also left us a legacy that it took about 1800, 2000 years to shake off. I mean, not, yes, their, so... not their civilization, but I mean that particular way, that very particular way of thinking, so valuable. And yet, why can we not value something? Why can we not value science without thinking that it explains everything? Why can we not value geometry by saying it's a useful tool? Right, right. But I suppose they, from a, from again, from a scientific perspective, we're always looking to say, well, how useful is it? Where are the boundaries of useful and non-useful? Right. So, how use? What's the domain of applicability of this? And at what point, under what circumstances, does it cease to be valid? Um, and so that's why I think quantum mechanics mm. is so valuable. It's actually showing us rather precisely where yes. the validity breaks down. And I so, think... as long as we... yeah, go on, yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, so as long as we say that an object is in a region or has a region valued location, the way I would put it, then one one can understand Bohr's idea of complementarity in this context to say that there's one way of thinking mm. where you say the object is not at a point mm. at that instant, it's mm. at a region. Yes. Region valued position. And then there's no problem in it having a memory of its well, past. Exactly. And that is that memory I want to see if we can come to because um, I want to sort of, as you would say, draw back or pull back from from that close picture. I mean, Niels Bohr actually also said the question in science is not what is true or not, but under what circumstances is it true or not? And something very similar was said by A.M. Whitehead. So uh, I think we can agree about that. But the thing that's really interesting here is that this past and this future are in the realm of potential. And what is what we're trying to pin down is what we call the actual and the actual may be the closure of this, the collapse of this field of possibly infinite potential, I don't know, but certainly a field of potential, your region, if you like, during, within which we can't be any more specific. And that thinking in terms of uh, the possible, what is there as potential is it's terribly important if we it's important in terms of truth, but it may even be important in terms of what, as you rightly um, keep drawing attention to, is utility. Because if we keep thinking only about the actual, we don't take into account the potential that is neglected when we focus only on what is immediately obvious around us. I took a very simple, uh, I don't want to do little excursions for a second. You know, when I was talking about the flat earth and the garage and the actual roundness of the earth, if you just look around you, you don't see any evidence of God. If you view things from this entirely rationalistic perspective, I can't see it, I can't measure it, I don't know where it is, what are people talking about? But if you have a different way of thinking, which is contextualized by an embodied life and being an embodied soul, as I believe we are, you, you know that your experience is not summed up in this way and that there are other things that we are aware of that simply can't be detected and manipulated in the laboratory. And so, like love, you know, which is very, very real, but it is not measurable or manipulable. So I wanted just to say that and to say that if we are able to see the potential that is deep within what we call the actual, we get beyond it. And that potential may be at least as important as the actual. What closes down is very important. But Heidegger said, higher than actuality stands potentiality or possibility. And the right hemisphere is always seeing that however certain something may appear in the left hemisphere's vision of the world, there is always some degree of uncertainty, which is also a degree of possibility. While the right hemisphere is opening up to possibility, the left hemisphere is closing down to certainty. Now we need both of these tendencies, don't get me wrong. It's just that if we're looking at the actual nature of whatever it is that we can rely on as the sort of reality underlying our experience, then this seems to me a, a fruitful way to be thinking. Yes. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, just to go back to the 
the, the example that we're just talking about, about motion, you could say that the idea that we can be as precise as saying where something is, and it's at a geometrical point, is essentially the, the view of pure actuality, the purely actual, we're, we're squeezing out any possibility of potentiality. And, and that would be like the loss of the, the, the thing having no memory of the past. Um, exactly. And because... actually there's a, there's an interesting parallel in, in, in meditation, uh, maybe you may be familiar yes. with it, which is that if the attention is sufficiently intense yes. on any sensation or yes. memory or anything that's arising, especially visual images that arise in the mind, yes. when the attention is particularly intense, things yes. slow down, right? Yes. It's almost like they, 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 the movement yes. virtually ceases yes. um, and you can virtually hold these things in your mind in an in a almost static state and then examine them in, in great detail. So it seems to me that there may be a parallel there, a psychophysical parallel. Between... Yes, I like. Sorry, go on. No, no, please. No, no, no. I like that. Um, and um, what I just want to say, because there's a potential um, ambiguity, which is quite important in the idea of intense, because as you know, the whole business of meditation and mindfulness and so on is to lose that intent yes. and the intensity that comes with intent and therefore to be a field of potential into which something will come. Now in that, what I would say is the attention is not intense, which might suggest intense focus, but is in fact sustained, which is the opposite thing that the right hemisphere gives. If you give pure and sustained attention to something, then I know the experience you're describing, and I just wanted to gloss it in that way. Um, and what I think happens there is not that, as it were, time stops, but that it, it's like the flow of a river. If you stand on the bank and absent yourself from it and stand there with a stopwatch and a clipboard, you can see that things are passing all the time. But if you enter into that water and are actually able to flow with the water, you see that there is no movement because the movement you are in is move. You, you are moving, the thing is moving, there is no differential. And so, although the, the flow still continues, it feels different because you are present in it all the time. And one way of thinking about the business of potential is that the potential in the history of the flow before the moment, the artificial fantasy we have of this slice or moment in the flow, the potential is in its history, where, where this flow has come from and where it's going. If you take, if, if you were to try and locate it, you'd have to do what you say is to adopt a more regional approach because only what is coming before can really explain it. But what is then happening is all that can possibly explain what's coming after. And I think what happens, particularly nowadays, is that instead of understanding that everything is a flow, that history is a flow, that we come out of a flow and belong to a flow, both as people and as a society, is to have a left hemisphere random um, a conception, a map, a diagram, or a theory. This is how things should be. And we're just going to, as it were, stop the flow of the river and go off over here and start a new river. Well, it does not, it doesn't happen like that. Ian, Philip, thank you both for such a beautiful conversation. I think it might be a nice time to open to questions from, from the audience. Um, I know jo Jonathan is waiting in the wings um, <laughs> with, uh, a question um, but before we come to that I just want to explain to everyone how we'll uh, run the Q&A just to make it as seamless um, as possible um, so in order if you'd like to ask a question we ask you to do two things um, one is to put your question in the chat um, and that will we will open that just now so that should now be open so people should be able to enter their question into the chat um, but as well as entering your question into the chat, we'd like you to raise your hand, um, and we mean this electronically. So on um, the little Zoom toolbar, there's, there's a little button that says reactions, and um, on that reactions button, you should be able to, uh, there's another, once you click that, there's another little, little button that says raise hand. 
And if you raise your hand, then we're able to find you. And with 250 people in the room, it can be quite hard to find someone. We just see the question and we'd love to actually call on you and have you ask your question directly. Um, so that's why we operate things this, this way. And as Ian shared um, a couple of weeks ago, there are also the kind of um, other reactions you can do, like clapping hands or thumbs up or hearts or something, which you can, we kind of invite those expressions if you, if you, you know, feel like you resonate with something that is said. Um, okay, so with that, I would now like to ask um, Jonathan, um, and I have to, Jonathan, maybe you could raise your hand because I'm struggling to uh, find you. Uh, ah, there you are. Okay, cool. And if you can also start your video, Jonathan, and I'll add a spotlight to you so that everybody can see you. There we go. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Philip and Ian, for the great talk. I would normally hope to field the questions, but have parenting responsibilities tonight. Um, however, I do have time to ask one what well, quite big question, I hope. I could I could I could I could feel from your conversation that while you agreed on almost everything, um, there was some underlying difference of emphasis. And it's quite important for Ian's work in a more fundamental sense. This is to do with the fact that part of the pitch as a publisher for um the matter with things is that Ian, in effect, tries to make progress in philosophy. That in it, what he, the structure of the argument, as I've understood it and tried to explain it, is that he uses sort of systematic argumentation based on scientific references to show that the right hemisphere in aggregate, on balance, um, typically gives a more veridical account of reality, is closer to the truth in some fundamental sense than the left. Even though they're different, even though they're both of value, there is an asymmetry, as Ian mentioned, that one is somewhat more trustworthy than the other in a general sense, and not always, but in a general sense. And this is quite a fundamental claim, because that's what leads him to argue that where you have paradoxes, such as the ones relating to time and motion and so on that you've touched on, we should instinctively defer to the right hemisphere's perspective as being somehow the more fundamental reading of reality. But Philip, if I'm not mistaken, I sense you're not entirely persuaded by this, that that you seem to go so far as to accept, yes, yes, there's a case for the right hemisphere having a very valid and full and relevant and crucial perspective. Uh, and yes, it's very different from the left hemisphere perspective. And yes, it's hard to tease them apart in real life because cons consciousness plays a kind of trick, which means they co-arise. Nonetheless, I don't sense that you're fully persuaded that one is superior to the other, that one is necessarily more reliable or trustworthy. So the first part of the question is, am I right in suspecting that? <laughs> um, and if I am, how much follows for Ian's broader claims that he develops in the second volume of The Matter With Things? So e, first of all, Philip, and then Ian has perhaps respond to that. So Jonathan, you're, you're very perceptive. Um, I, I would say that this is, this is in some sense a, a tension I've lived with for two decades now, um, which is that I, I can, because of the process I've been through as a person, the per process of development, I, I feel I can switch between these two different perspectives. Um, and I've cultivated both of them. And there is part of me that is very uncomfortable with, with according priority to, to one perspective. I feel that it's probably, for me anyway, more helpful to say that we have two extraordinarily different ways of perceiving reality. And our job, if you like, as human beings is to find a way of, of honoring both of those perspectives and articulating them in language or, or shaping language, this technology, this wonderful technology we have that we call language, shaping language so it it is faithful to both of those perspectives. And also from a scientific perspective, discovering to in what domains can we apply, safely apply one perspective and when does it where does where does the other perspective need to be brought in and when and how. So 
I suppose from my perspective, my point of view in terms of my trajectory, I, I don't normally think in terms of one of these perspectives as being fundamentally superior or, or closer to reality. On the other hand, I'm, I, I'm, I'm torn because I, I agree with so much that Ian has said. And, and uh, I mean, Aristotle famously said in response to the, to the, to the paradox of motion that, you know, that we, to, to Parmenides claim that, you know, there, there's, no, there's no becoming, right? That there's just being, there's pure being and there's no motion. That that, that showed sort of a, sort of a, a weak, and in philosophical thinking to even fall for that, right? So we, we can't possibly take that seriously. So I'd also agree that if push comes to shove, the right hemisphere's view must take priority. That if there's ever, ever a need for adjudication, it's the right hemisphere that seems to be on the, on the money, so to speak, that its view seems to be very important. But certainly when I look at the development of scientific thought, especially theoretical physics, I can see time and again um, the, the power of, of the left hemispheric view of reality and, and the willingness to sort of push that forward. Um, and I think that, that that particular development, the emergence of modern science really was very much against um, it, it sort of emerged in very much in reaction to a much more, the insistence of a much more nuanced view of reality. So in other words, sometimes the, it seems to me that the right hemisphere's insistence on nuance and context can, as it were, paralyze the left hemisphere's exploration of reality. Uh, I do worry about that. So I think that sometimes the right hemisphere needs to say, look, I don't agree with what you're doing. Uh, from a, from a, I don't agree with the decontextualization, but just go and see what happens if you do, right? And, I, and, and then, then there needs to be a contrary movement where once the left hemisphere has gone off and done its thing, the right hemisphere has to have the authority to reflect on that properly. And as long as this process, this back and forth process is respected by the culture, then all is well. But if one of these gets out of, out of balance, mm then we're, I think, as a culture, then one is in trouble. And, and it can go one way or the other. Right. I mean, uh, Sorokin has this idea of ideational versus sensate cultures, and those represent those two extremes. And the idealistic culture represents the harmonious synthesis of these two perspectives. Right. Sorry, that was a long answer to your no, question. It was, a, it was a great and very full answer. Thank you. And I know, Ian, this is right at the heart of your work, so you'll have plenty to say about it. So yes. add one, one little one little sort of addition mm. addendum to the question that then Ian can answer. Mm. Um, it, it sounds a bit facile at first blush, but when I've raised this point with mm. some philosophers that I've met, whenever I say that there's evidence to suggest that on balance, and as mm. Philip put it, when push comes to shove, mm. um, very technically, but I, I know what you mean, when you have to adjudicate that the right hemisphere somehow has priority because it mm. sees more fully, more deeply, uh, mm -hmm. more, partic more particularly, and so on. Yes. Nonetheless, the, the, the critic would say, who is making that judgment? Is the right hemisphere making the judgment on behalf of the right hemisphere? Is the whole yeah. brain somehow I've, doing I've it? I've heard all that, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know what you are. But just, just that's where people who are not very familiar with your work are coming from, Ian. So just yeah. first yeah. of all, respond to Philip's qualms Yes, um, and then ask answer. Yes, exactly. On what basis is the authority other than many thousands of pages? Can you try and <laughs> distill it for us? Okay. I mean, the first thing I would say is that um, uh, Philip again returns to the idea that this kind of thinking has proved useful, and I never said that it was not useful. I never have ever suggested it is not useful. I'm only, inter you always say. only interested in whether it's true. There are many fictions that we incorporate into our life that are very useful, but they're just not true. Um, one parallel I was thinking of between science and theology. <laughs> so theologians might say, well, you're against all these dogmas and these written texts and all that and just saying this is the truth. But actually just saying this is the truth and having dogmas has helped the church for thousands of years. It's, it's produced wonderful things. But at the end of the day, what is religion about? Absolutely not about dogma and certainty and things that are written in language. Sure. 
So that's a parallel. Mm. Then let us come on to reasons why one might think it truer. You don't have to be a physicist or a philosopher to know that, and uh, I can't uh, give you all the references, but they're all there in part one of the book, that having looked at this for 30 years, I am convinced that the right hemisphere sees that what the left hemisphere thinks of as fixed, certain, and familiar is not necessarily fully known, not ever going to be completely certain, and not um, not, not, not fixed. So it, it, and it, neither is it isolated. The left mm-hmm. hemisphere isolates things, but in reality, we know that nothing is isolated. In reality, we know that relations are prior to relata. And in fact, several physicists, including Pete Hood and David Merman, have actually said as much, and I quote them in the book. Um, We know that the implicit is fabulously important, that much meaning is conveyed not by the sort of meaning a computer would pick up, but by all the the hidden aspects of language in metaphor, in in comparisons, in, in body language, in facial language, in tone of voice, and so on. The right hemisphere gets that, the left hemisphere doesn't. The left hemisphere abstracts. The right hemisphere sees things as they are. The left hemisphere sees only categories. The right hemisphere True. sees individual. But, Look, I'm just saying this because, I, listen, you put me on the spot yeah. and you're asking me to say why. Right. And what I'm saying is the left hemisphere's world is not just something I don't happen to think is right, but no normal person walking about or listening to this is going to say that is a truthful image of the world. It is not. Yeah. Secondly, right. Now, hang on, because Philip's had a long say and you have, so I'm just going to ask answer your question. You said it's important, so I'm answering it. Okay. When people have lesions in one or other hemisphere, it is very clear that they are deluded very often after having delu- uh, damage to the right hemisphere, much less often after damage to the left. Now, delusion, you may say, well, who decides what's a delusion? You know? If I really believe there are little pink men from Mars living in uh, my garden shed, who's to say that they're not right? I would appeal to experience, common sense, philosophical um, uh, um, sophistication and so forth, that nobody is going to say, well, who decides? They are actually deluded and they see things that are not there. Is that or is that not? being deluded. If you see there is a large pink rabbit sitting in the room, and I've had patients who think that, is somebody going to say to me, really, there is a large pink rabbit there, somebody may say, and they may be right. I'm saying, yes, ultimately, one can never be certain that something that's seen by somebody is not right. But I'm talking in general terms, you can quite clearly see that the left hemisphere gets deluded, unless the right hemisphere helps recontextualize, Mm -hmm. sophisticate the whole thing. So those are at least three reasons why I would say It's quite clear that the right hemisphere is more important. And when you look at this, I'm not saying that, you know, there are just these two things. I'm saying there need to be these two things, but one of them is very much closer to the truth, the better guide to the truth. Mm. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put your life's work on the spot there. It was just with what I thought no, was no. a, a new I answer. thought it was a brilliant question. Yeah, right. But since it's a brilliant question and it had a brilliant answer, I wanted to give my answer. Sure, okay. But my, answer to, my answer to your philosophers is to read my work and right. then tell me that they think the left hemisphere is just as good a guide to reality as the right. I, I happen to agree with you. <laughs> I know you as do. As you know. But I, yeah. I'm also curious um, because I haven't spent my life, as I believe, much of my... You know, professional life, as I believe Philip has, seeing the enormous power of the models, and I, and I wonder if the response to what you just said is not so much to deny the delusion of the left hemisphere. It's very partial, very particular, grasping approach to reality um, that abstracts and loses context. But just the 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 more challenging claim is the basis for the authority is not that one is somehow true and the other is not true right because there's a sense in which the left hemisphere's verdict has its own truth but you're saying somehow the fuller truth the, the more the the more the, the oh. more reliable truth lies in the rights well it depends what you mean by truth i think what we've unveiled in the last conversation with with philip you know over the last hour has, it has been very 
significant because time and again it's come down to it may be useful but it may be a useful fiction right Right. And and so I'm not suggesting it's not useful. I mean, Western the, the trouble with Western philosophy, as you know, is it's based on a severely analytic tradition which believes in a very left hemisphere fashion. You find out things by analyzing, cutting them up and cutting them up until you can't say anything about anything. Right. That and that neglects the whole richness of language and thought that is outside of that. And I think nowadays people are getting tired of that and beginning to move away from it. Thank God. So I mean, that is one thing. And the other is that we live in an age in which it's almost impossible for anybody any longer to think that if there are two things, one of them may be import, more important than the other. We leave, live in an age in which symmetry, equality is the truth, and it isn't. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Philip, how do you want to respond to that? And then I'll probably take my leave, but let's hear from you first. Well, it's, uh, it's obviously, this is a really a, a very, like a fundamental point. Uh, and What I would say, and there is a part of me that, that is not comfortable with saying that the left hemisphere's view is merely useful, um, that it's that it's somehow not true. And I, I don't, I mean, I think for a physicist, it's, it's very hard to, to swallow that. Um, certainly, I think um, the great physicists in pursuing physics were drawn to it because they felt they were really getting at the deep structure of reality. And I think that the, the achievements of physics go well beyond simple utility for humanity's benefit. Uh, it, we're really talking about having a set of equations that, that describe the electrons and atoms and molecules at a ridiculous level that um, allow us to send spaceships that can end up in Pluto um, and we, you know, we can we can plot trajectories. We can do all of this. I, I think that there's a, the question is: Are we going to put all those achievements on the side of utility and say that they're not that somehow we, we will deny them truth? I have a I have a very hard time with that as a physicist. And I think that the, the most physicists, or I think a lot of physicists, will be drawn to physics because they really do think they're getting at some real truth, even a, even though a limited truth, but they're getting at something okay. very deep. So, so I think that's the, so I mean, so this is my personal way that I, I personally think that there's just a conversation happening between two different modes of perceiving reality. You know, I'm also a meditator, so I experience reality all the time in a completely different way, but I also experience it as a physicist. So I have to somehow just manage this on a day by day basis myself. And personally, I tend not to regard one as necessarily superior on an ongoing basis. But having said that, there are these critical moments where you have to make a, a decision. Um, and so at a critical moment, it does seem to me without fail that, that, that the right hemisphere's view seems to be leading me in a, a better direction. And so in that sense, uh, the right hemisphere has priority. But I also think that the autonomy is incredibly important and the history of development of science, I think shows that, that it was, it was very important for science and for culture to allow the left hemisphere to, to run and discover its own truth, to use that word, and, and then somehow adjudicate between these truths. So I would, I would suggest a, sort of a, a more, a picture like that, I would say. I mean, can I, can I, I know you want to bring in other people, obviously, but I, I feel I've got to comment on that. And but partly because I want to agree with it. I mean, partly I want to say um, that I, I, I constantly spend my life saying there's nothing in itself wrong with the left hemisphere. We need it. But I, I don't make claims for its ultimate truth. I think within a certain context in which many things are excluded, it may be true for those purposes. For example, if I completely contextualize the garage I'm building and cut out the world, the measurements and everything I do are entirely true to reality, but it's not the whole reality and therefore not really true. That's really the point I'm making. And that's why I do sort of accept the idea of a certain degree of truth. But ultimately, I'd rather say that it has a kind of beauty, and it has a kind of fascination for the mind. And it may reveal, who knows, some aspect of reality. In fact, it probably does. 
It's just that the trouble is that we started to think that this way of thinking will lead us to reality. And what I'm saying is no. And I, I think that, you know, when you say it's the world that we have, um, we've had these, that's had this unfolding over the last 400 years, I would just sound a note of skepticism and caution. Of course, it's lovely being in the world we're in now, but we're probably going to end the world because of this kind of thinking. And that the world that existed before it, in which the right and left hemisphere worked in the master and emissary way, where the emissary just helped the master, but the master had the overview, might have been a more fruitful, more lasting fulfillment of life and humanity. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to pick my leave in a second. I know there's lots of hands up, but it's such a rich vein and, and right on the nub of the matter. And Philip, you said something that I just want to double check, and then I'll leave and let Michael take over. <clears throat> um, I remember from studying uh, when I did meta metaphysics at university, there was a school of structural realism, which broadly argues that the sort of the mathematical structure of reality is something we can be sure of. Um, and as I understand you, Philip, you're describing some of the sort of not so much the quantum theory, but the quantum mechanics as such as feeling like it has its own kind of truth, um, even if it also has utility. But you also said something fascinating, which was that there are moments of adjudication where you feel the right hemisphere is leading you somewhere better, more true. And I just want you to describe phenomenologically what that's like as somebody who knows meditation, as someone who knows physics. What does it feel like for your mind to be saying one way is somewhat more trustworthy than the other? As far as possible, talk us through that experience and I'll take my leave and let others ask some questions. Thanks for now. Thank you, Jonathan, for, you know, again, another fantastic question. Um, well, these moments of adjudication have, for, for me happened at certain critical moments in life and really changed the life, my life course. So, um, in fact, it was in 1998 when I um, was, was working in neuroscience for a period of time. And I went into that direction because I really wanted to somehow bring together the sort of my physics perspective and to understand the nature of mind. And I thought, well, what better thing to do than learn about neuroscience? Um, and then what I what happened is it, quite quickly, I felt very, very powerfully that I'm missing the essential point, that, I, that I'm never really going to understand the nature of mind through this mechanistic reduction to neural networks and such like. Um, you know, I can study the neuro, neurochemistry and so on, but in the end, it's just a mechanism. I'm just looking at it through a mechanistic lens. And there was this very powerful experience uh, of this is just not the way. This is just not the way. You're just missing the absolute, the absolute essence. And you have to understand at that point, um, I hadn't developed my thinking, so I didn't really know what the alternative was. But there was just this powerful sense of, no, this is not the way. If you really want to get at the essence of mind, this is not the way. And so it's that then that took me in the direction of looking at, looking more broadly at the literature. And um, I, I was very fortunate to encounter Robert Rosen. Yeah. And that was revelatory for me. That, that's when I encountered him. And, and that's when I realized, oh, maybe there is a way. Maybe there is a way of satisfying the left hemisphere with its insistence on mathematical precision and, and, and potentially scientific consequences, testable consequences, whilst at the same time as honoring the sense that there's much more to the mind yes. and the living thing than simply neural networks or cells interacting with each other. So that was a perfect, that was a moment of adjudication where it, it came from the heart. You know, it's, it's a moment from the heart to say, well, no, this is not the way. And, and I've experienced this at various points uh, in my interpretation of quantum theory as well, where I think, well, there's something very wrong about this interpretation. And, and I can't justify it at the time, but it, it's then what, it, it has a powerful momentum at a personal level, and it, it takes you off in a certain direction, in a different direction, maybe to everyone else around you. I, I know we got to... <laughs> this conversation I, I need to continue and uh, you know i'm not against science i think that science is sometimes unscientific in its dogmatism it rules out various possibilities what i love about quantum field theory 
at any rate, which is, I gather, the current, well, certainly one of the commonly perceived as um, helpful models, um, is that it accords entirely with this idea that the right hemisphere sees what the left hemisphere sees, but is able to recontextualize it in a way that is more truthful. So that there are, of course, these particles, whatever we mean by that, and I don't say that there is no such thing, but it sets it all in a context in which um, precision, although a good goal, can never be ultimately achieved. Certainty, although something we desire, can never, not because we're not bright enough, but in the nature of things, never be finally uh, decided, and that things are ultimately interconnected and so forth. So it's entirely in keeping. Quantum field theory, the physics that I understand, seems to me, to express all the things that I'm trying to say are the insights that we gather from the right hemisphere. And I wonder if when your heart spoke to you, it was your right hemisphere. Partly because when often people talk in cultural terms about their heart, I think what they're talking about is attending, is silencing the chatter of the left hemisphere. <laughs> we must have some Wonderful. questions. Must have Wonderful. questions. <laughs> So mm -hmm. I very quickly I need to share. I think I've been maybe there's a conflict in, between my left and right hemisphere because my left hemisphere is maybe anxious that we have so much time for questions and we've almost <laughs> used all of up, and my right hemisphere is rejoicing at this kind of flow <laughs> and unfolding, which is just the way things go sometimes. Mm. So I would like to invite um, Elaine um, to to uh, speak. And Elaine, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Spotlight. I'm going to find my question. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And forgive me if my question is a bit naive, because I'm certainly not a physicist um, or nor indeed a philosopher. But I just wondered how quantum changes at the micro level in, could influence external reality, especially if consciousness is all pervasive and filtered by the brain. Are we constantly, in fact, flowing from potential to actuality? And is that where our intention and attention can change, or can they change external reality in terms of perceiving and creating our reality? Thank you. Do you want to go first, Philip, or shall I? Actually, I prefer if you would go first. Okay, on this okay. Topic. You raise a lot of different uh, topics there in that question. Um, I think. You're right that there is always this dialogue between potential and actual, in that when something is actualized, it changes the field of what can be potential. There's something I write about in the book. So that the actual also contributes to the potential, which then itself is part of the field out of which the actual will occur. So I think that that, that is certainly true. And I think that the the important point is that one of these is is overarching the attention of the right hemisphere is such as to be able to bring about changes this only sustained attention to something can really perceive what it is a very fleeting glimpse may you may be lucky you may get it but you may not and my thesis, as you know, expanded in part one, is that attention gives rise. This is a moral act because it actually changes what is, including what we are. So that the right hemisphere is attention, again, is there's nothing wrong with the left hemisphere attention. We would, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to pack up a seed or grab a rabbit, but we need that big picture. Otherwise, we won't survive. Over to you, Philip. Right. Um, well, I could perhaps say a few words about how quantum theory illuminates this very key point. Um, in the classical way of thinking, Newtonian way of thinking, measurement is an entirely passive process. So we think of what one could say metaphorically that measurement is light-like. In other words, it's, it's, a, it, it's almost like an abstraction of, of what it feels like to look at something. You feel it, you look at something like an object that you don't fundamentally change the object you see as it actually is. Um, and so this idea that this isn't someone's asking in the chat about objective reality. So this, that would be the idea that, well, look, the, the reality is out there in the way it is the way it is now. And when we 
as physicists or as individuals, we, we make measurements on the world, we look at the world, we see it as it is, we register as it is. And in principle, in the Newtonian picture, in principle, we can measure as precisely as we wish, as we wish without bringing any changes in what we're observing. So there's this almost like God's eye perspective, as it's often called. But with quantum theory written right into the mathematics of the theory, so this is not speculative at all, right? there's, a, there's a postulate, it's called a measurement postulate, and it's the bane of any interpreter of quantum theory, and people split very much on, on this point of how you, what you say about the measurement postulate. So according to the measurement postulate, if you read it literally, the very act of making a measurement on a microscopic system changes it in some fundamental way. And the choice of whether to measure or not, therefore, is causally relevant. It, it affects the flow. It, it, it affects the flow. It bends the flow in some way. The, the degree of precision matters mm -hmm. also. If, if it's a not very precise measurement, it has very little effect on the flow. Mm -hmm. But as it becomes more precise, the flow is twisted ever so you know, much, much more strongly. And as I said, in the limiting case of infinite precision, there's, you completely, as you were, destroy the flow momentarily. And then furthermore, in, according to this quantum picture, the very choice of measurement that you do matters. So that the, in quantum theory, there's, there's a choice of measurement. Um, and we, that's something that's coming from us as human beings, that we choose to do a certain measurement. And that, that itself is also a very important. And so the, the analog to that in, in our psychological experience, one can see very clearly in meditation, um, the, the very act of, uh, the very way one is attending to mental phenomena moment by moment in, directs the flow. I mean, it's something one can experience very directly within our own, you know, with our own minds. So I think there's a very close parallel between these. And I think one of the delightful things really about but the state of physics now is that we have a physical theory, a fundamental physical theory, which is in, in some sense in, in such parallelism with something that we can experience directly. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Philip. I'm conscious that we are at our 100 minute mark um, and this event seems to have gone faster than any other previous <laughs> event, which um, maybe that's something that physicists should really investigate whether time does fly when you're having fun. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, this feels like something, uh, this somehow feels unfinished to me and that this, this could really go on. Um, and I really do hope it does. And I wonder- Yes, I would love maybe, that. Maybe, yeah. Um, Ian and Philip, if you, if I just kind of want, to invite both of you just to if you have any closing remarks you'd like to offer um just to bring this this space to a close well one of them is that i would like to do that with with philip <laughs> at some future point to take things further but i thought one way of bringing things to a harmonious conclusion is of i think a brilliant quotation from the physicist Lee Smolin, who I enormously admire and follow, particularly in his view of time, which I think is far more sophisticated than most other theories of time that are doing the rounds. And he says, one way to unify things that appear different is to show that the apparent difference is due to the difference in the perspective of the observers. A distinction that was previously considered absolute becomes relative. And I would like to say the difference between the hemispheres is relative. This kind of unification is rare and represents the highest form of scientific creativity. When it's achieved, it radically alters our view of the world. Well, thank you for the conversation. Um, I, I, I think in these particularly difficult times, I mean, socially, we're in a I think humanity is in a very perilous position and I, I deeply resonate with Ian's great worry about uh, humanity and, and where we're going, you know, with all the things that are happening, which I won't bother to enumerate. I, I think we're all familiar with the challenges that we face uh, collectively. I do think it's really important as far as we can to focus on, on the positive, uh, even though it may seem that the positive 
the rays of light may seem overwhelm, overwhelmingly overpowered by the, the, the negatives. Um, so I, I think that's a challenge, um, you know, obviously for each of us to figure out in our own ways, uh, ways of proceeding positively and optimistically in spite of all the, the challenges around us. Um, so I, I'm personally very grateful for Ian's work, which I uh, encountered many, many years ago, in, uh, around 2010, 2011. I think it's it's a beacon. Uh, it's an extremely rich uh, repository of ideas uh, and observations. Um, so I'd just like to thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, it's 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 an enormously well, important thing. Thank you very much for those very kind words. And I just would like to say that I owe a great deal to you. Uh, you have introduced me to things made me feel that there was some worth in my vision of what I was doing that could resonate with physics. And so thank you very much. We will talk again. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Thank, thank you, you, Philip, so much. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, and I would just like to say for all of you who are who are um, uh, anchoring for more uh, very soon, um, we have a, a connection inquiry section um, next week that we've been running. These are more discussion based. Um, so that's an opportunity for us to maybe um, come together and wrestle over these ideas and play and contest and disagree and agree and all the rest of it. Um, and Jonathan, I think, said that um, in a week's time we have Amir Shahid, but it's actually yeah. two weeks time. Two weeks. Yeah, it's two weeks time. Yeah, may, I, may I just May. comment on that because he didn't seem to know who it was. Yeah, <laughs> this absolutely, is, this, absolutely. This is because he is someone I met in Geneva in the last um, few days and have talked incessantly with. He's a, a young man who works for the WHO. He is incredibly interested in philosophy, but he is practically interested in bringing clean water to the world. And he is unmissable. So I just wanted to say that in case people thought, well, I don't know who. Look him up. He's a great man. <laughs> and on that note, we can look forward to that in two weeks' time. So thank you, everyone. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll sign off. Be well, everyone. See you all Thank soon. Thank you. Thanks very much.